Hey, how are you doing? My name is Maddie and I wanna welcome you to The Message. It's a privilege that you connect with us. The message you're about to hear is going to be a huge blessing for your life and that is why we wanna invite you to get rid of any distractions around you and focus on the truths that God has for you today. Sit back, stay until the end and enjoy. There is a blessing there, it's, just, it's good. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why I, why I like him because he was a preacher and uh, preachers tend to screen a little bit. And, and uh, teachers are awesome and we grow with teachers and they are more calm. And we need, how many, how many people know that we need teachers in the house? We need, we need teachers in the house, but we also need the preaching of the word of God. And I believe in the preaching. So but anyway, I'm grabbing the mic. And, uh, and I'm, I'm almost six, uh, uh, week six of the series uh, Kingship. Uh, it's on the, based on the book of Nehemiah. Um, I'm going to talk about Charles Spurgeon in a minute, but um, the book of Nehemiah um, is just, uh, I find it so um, present, so relevant to what we're living um, as, a, as a community, as a church, not only our church, but the church um, of Christ in the world, the church um, that proclaimed the name of Jesus in the world, and everything that we are seeing uh, you know how how the world is attacking more uh, and more, and is bombarding. Um, I've been I've been talking a lot about the the culture, the, the cancel culture. Nowadays, if you say anything that will offend the world, they'll cancel you. They don't even listen and listen to you anymore, and uh, they want us to just be accepting. But to the point that agreeing, like I, I was sharing about that a few weeks ago, um, otherwise you get canceled. Um, but they will not agree with us. Are you with me? Because in the moment they agree with us based on what the Bible says, then it will contradict their beliefs. It's a system that is a totalitarian. Uh, it is... Uh, uh, so um, in your face and so controlling. And, you know, it's, it's hard to really be a, a, a Christian in the public uh, sphere nowadays. Um, but God wants us to be faithful. God wants us to remain faithful to him, to continue to, in love, continue to preach the truth. Because that's what sets us free. Amen. Um, loving Accepting will not set people free. The truth will set us people, will set people free. But we need to do it in love and, and acceptance, but we need to still preach the truth. Um, Nehemiah is a book where, uh, and, and I'm just going to go back for some of the people that are not here for the first time. A little bit of uh, what happened is we read the book of Nehemiah from the, from the very beginning. We hear that Nehemiah, who was stay in Babylon uh, and the exile uh, of Israel, they went back to Israel to find a city that was completely destroyed, completely in ruins. Nehemiah heard about that, and he right away went into prayer and fasting and mourning before the Lord. And he asked the Lord, can I please do something for my people, for my country, for my city. And, uh, and the Lord granted him favor with the king. The king provided. The king wasn't a Christian, but he provided uh, everything that Nehemiah needed in order for him to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Um, we talked about favor, how favor, the favor of God is, is what we need as a church right now. When the favor of God is upon a church, there is a level of grace and provision and favor. The word favor over somebody that makes things easier for us to do something. It's that called the grace of God. The grace of God is not for us to have license to sin and to do whatever we want, knowing that God will forgive us. No, 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 no. The grace of God is just that favor that opens the door so we don't have to do it in our own strength. So the things that we need to call, I mean, to accomplish, it is done because of the power of the Holy Spirit in us opening the doors. And that's called the favor of God. 
Amen. And Nehemiah experienced that favor. And he went back to Jerusalem. And he began to, uh, to, uh, to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And with that, there are so many different things that we can learn. The strategies that he had. The planning that he had. He wasn't only just praying. He was planning. And one of the things that we are going to learn today is that he also was hands on doing something. And if we want to see God, the kingdom of God to, do, to, to be established in our churches, in our cities, in our own families. We need to be people that not only pray, but also plan, but also people of action. Amen. And uh, I love that because uh, the, the subtitle of today, because we're going to continue. We left last week. Uh, we read last week from uh, Nehemiah 4, from 1 to, uh, to 14. And we're going to continue today with 15 to 23. And we're going to finish uh, Nehemiah 4. It's going to take a long time. <laughs> but uh, that's okay. We love the word of God. We have to, after I, I said to my wife, how, she asked me, how long is this series for? And I said, I don't know, maybe 16, 17 weeks. It's like, oh, wow, it's a long, don't say, yeah, but I have to preach on Sundays anyway. So may as well preach the whole book, right? <laughs> so, uh, and, and it's, it's great. So the, the subtitle for today, I called it uh, The Sore and the Trowel. And it wasn't, uh, uh, you know, inspiration that I got from the Holy Spirit. It was actually inspired by this guy, Charles Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon, uh, he was, um, they call him the prince of preachers. He was, in his era, he was the greatest preacher. They say that he's been one of the greatest preachers that ever lived. Uh, he dedicated his life to preach on the message of the cross. Actually, when, when people ask him, you know, so how come you have so many people coming to your meetings? He says, it's because of the message of the cross. People need the cross. And, uh, but he started in 1865 a magazine called The Sword and the Trowel. And he spent time in that magazine to edify uh, the people that were receiving Jesus, the body of Christ, but also the local church. He had a heart for the local church. If you read scriptures, and, and when I say the local church, it doesn't mean just this church and that's it. The local church is the body of Christ, but also divided into individuals, families, that this family is called Connection Family. This is the local church. That We have other churches in Victoria with different names, identified with the different names, but that is the local church. And then is the, the church of God, of Jesus at large. And, is, and we are all working together to expand the kingdom of God. So the church at large, amen, amen. becomes in, an influential force, a body, a family here on earth. But it starts with the local church. We need to do our part. We as church, as connection, we need to do our, our part. Our part is not to look at other churches, what they are doing and trying to do it better. Our part is... It is found on the secret place in our, on our knees and, and asking Jesus, what do you want us to do? Are you with me? Because they are doing their part. We need to do our part. Otherwise, the wall, the kingdom will not be edified fully. And um, I love that because the uh, uh, prince, uh, uh, prince, the prince of preachers, <laughs> Charles Spurgeon, based a whole magazine based on Nehemiah 4 uh, and we're going to read that right now I'm just going to read the whole thing and then we're going to go back in line by line so it says this with my glasses it says verse 15 are you with me church so far so good it's good all right it says when our enemies heard then we knew of their plans I love that and then God has frustrated them we all return work to our work on the wall. Remember last time we were talking about how they built half because they had enthusiasm and the confusion came. But then Nehemiah came and encouraged them and said, let's go for it. And then we read this, you know, said then the enemy heard, then, then they knew their plan. So they went back to work, it says, verse 16. From then on, only half my men worked while they only half stood guard with spears, shields, bows, and cuts 
of mail. I was thinking, what is that? And it's the thing that, you know, that the, the mesh that um, with the steel that they used to put back in the days, you know? And it was always like, amazing. I would, I, I would love to be there. <laughs> um, and it says here, the leaders stationed themselves behind the people of Judah. We who were building the wall, the laborers carried on the work with one hand supporting the, the Lord and with the other hand holding a weapon. All the builders had a sword belted on, the, on, the, on their side. The trumpeters stayed with me to sound the alarm. There was a, there was a, they were organized. They were doing something. They were all together. It says, then I explained to the nobles and the officials and all the people, the work is very spread out. We are widely separated from each other along the, the wall. So when you hear the blast of the trumpet, rush to whatever it is, it is sounding, then our God will fight for us. Do you love that? So we work early and late. I love that part because there are some people, it's like they, they, they're preaching now. It's like we need to do less. We need to do more people. There's a whole bunch of people that are not, no, they don't know Jesus yet. It's not time to, to rest. It's time to have your own resting in the Lord, in the presence of the Lord. That doesn't mean become lazy. It means you are spending time with him. You're strengthening yourself. You're developing that relationship with him. You're resting because it's not in your own strength. That is resting. You need that. If you, don't, if you don't do that, and we want to learn that, you are going to burn out. You need that resting in the Lord. But, but some people are using that resting as like, I'm not going to do a single thing right now. Well, people are going to hell into an eternity while the church is having a good time. That wasn't part of the preaching. But... Um, it says, we work early and late from sunrise to sunset and have the men were always on guard. As I, told, I also told everyone living outside the walls to stay in Jerusalem. It says that their way and their servants could help with guard duty at night and work during the day. During this time, none of us, no I, nor my relatives, nor my servants, people that work for me. Nor the guards who were with me ever took off our clothes. I'm not going to preach about that. It's good to get changed and have showers. Uh, we carry our weapons with us at all times, even when we went for water. Jesus, speak to us today, Lord. We just open our hearts. We open our minds to you, to your word, to the power of your word. Holy Spirit, may you just come and speak to us today, Lord. We are open. We, are, we, we have our, our hearts wide open for you to come and speak your word to us. I just pray, Lord, that when we leave this place, Lord Jesus, that we will live encouraged, equipped, and ready to do your work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's go by line by line. It says here in verse 15, it says, When our enemies heard that we knew of their plans and that God has frustrated them, we all return to our work on, on the wall. It's so important for us to know that um, there, there is um, a thing called God revealing his secrets in the secret place. We often fight without knowing the truth of the word of God. And we are fighting instead of declaring, instead of acting, instead of uh, proclaiming and believing that the, the battle has already been won by our Savior and our Lord Jesus Christ. Are you with me, church? We're fighting like if we go up into the ring with the enemy 
with lies, he, was, he, he comes with lies, he was come with tortures, he was come with torments, he comes with uh, confusion, he comes with that. And we ourselves go up in the, in the arena with the enemy without knowing that Jesus said, you are more than conqueror already. Knowing that I already fought for you, I already defeated him. All you need to do is put the belt. Are you with me, church? He is a, the Bible says that he is conqueror, and he calls us more than conquerors. Why? Because we get to wear the belt, the, the championship, without us even fighting against the enemy. Now, there is a fight. There is a spiritual warfare that takes place, but no fighting one at the same level. is declaring the, the spiritual warfare is declaring the things that Jesus already did for us. He's shutting the mouth of the enemy, saying, devil, you have no power. You have no authority over my family. You have no authority and power of my, over my life. That is the fighting. That is the reminding him. Look what it says here in 2 Corinthians 2, 11. Is when he's talking about forgiveness. This is Paul saying, talking about you, you need to forgive. You need to, you need to love your, your, the people around you. And then he says, so that Satan will not outsmart us. Are you with me, church? It says, for we are familiar with his evil schemes. We know your plans and they will not work here because I am in Jesus Christ. As families, as parents, even as single people, we need to know the word of God and we need to proclaim the word of God and we need to remind the enemy, you have no luck, no part. You have nothing to do with me because I'm more than victorious in Jesus' name. We need to know what, what Paul said here, so Satan doesn't as smart us. What does it mean is that when we don't know, he'll come and he thinks that he's winning. And then you begin to believe that. Are you with me, church? How many people you have talked to or even yourself believe that because your grandparent was an alcoholic and your parent was an alcoholic, then you are meant to be an alcoholic. How many people do I talk to that say, oh, my great-grandfather cheated on my great-grandmother and then they divorced and then, my great, and then my grandfather and then my father. So I am just prompt to do that. And those are lies of the enemy. Because if you are in Christ, that whole inheritance is broken in the name of Jesus. You are a new creation. Are you with me, church? You, you, that, that, you, you know what new creation means? You are created a new, different bloodline. Are you with me, church? You are. You are not what your grandparents and your grandpa, great-grandparents are. You are now new in Christ. You need to know this so you can come and tell the enemy, no, that was my parents. This is not me. Are you with me? That is that so and so. This is not me. I am a new creation in Christ. And, and Paul said, we don't, we don't ignore the evil schemes of the enemy. I love this here because as we are reading the Old Testament, Nehemiah is writing this. When the enemy knew that we knew their plans, we all went back to work. Why? Because knowing gives you power. You have the power to go back to do the work of the Lord if you have knowledge. Are you with me, church? Let's continue here. It says, but from then on, only half of my men work what only half stood guard with spears, shields, balls, and coats of mail. Coats of mail. The leaders stationed themselves behind the people of Judah. It says, who were building the wall. So there were people who were hands-on. And people behind, praying, covering with the weapons. Are you with me, church? And we want to talk about three different things in a minute. Since the labor carried on their work with one hand supporting the lot and with the other hand holding the weapon. So they were hands on. I should have brought a trowel. Now you said, well, you said I work a lot. And then the sword. Um, so they were, they were hands-on. They were building and they had the word of God. I spoke a, bit, a little bit about that last week. It says they heard the, the, the hands-on supporting the Lord. The hand-on, the weapon. It says verse 13. It says, and all the builders had a sword belted to their side. They were ready. Where is your Bible? Praise God for the app now, right? 
It's right here. But where is the word of God in your house? Is it buried? Is your life depending on the preacher? What if we don't preach the truth? What if we mix the truth with our own agendas? What if the podcast you're listening to is so good but so deceiving that you think it's the truth? But you don't know because you don't have the filter of the word of God. What is the word in your house? What is the word of God in your life? How are you guarding your life? How are you protecting yourself? How are you filtering and allowing things in your life that are edifying for the soul, for the spirit? Are you with me, church? And they were ready. They had the sword belted to their side. It's here with me. It's, it, I know the word. I don't just depend on the Sunday preachings or the, or the podcasts that I listen to. And it says, and then it says here, and then the trumpeters stayed with me to sound, to sound the alarm, the prophets, the people, the worshipers, servants. I love that. It takes, it, it, you know, if I, if, I, if I read this, it tells me that they were doing three different things. And I just want to very quickly go through three, these three different things. I didn't have them in there because I just got that last night. <laughs> and uh, um, as I'm reading and reading, it says, my goodness, they were so in tune with what God wanted to do. And they were so in tune and it's so relevant to what the church of Christ nowadays need to do. These three different things that I see here is that, first of all, when they say that the leaders were behind, when they had the sword of God, when they had the, the, the thing belted to their side, is that they were interceding. There were people who were interceding. There were people who were praying and interceding. There were people who were edifying, who were working hands-on. I love when people said, you know, I, I, I remember this person uh, that came to me and says, I, Pastor, never put me to preach. I will never preach in front of people. That's a different thing. But I can cook. And I can host people and make a good meal. And when you think about that, that's edifying. That's building the kingdom. Some of you may not be able to preach. Some of you preach way better than me. That's easy, but... It, it, but what are you doing? Are you edifying? And I see that God is putting people here to pray, to intercede, people to edify. And another thing that I saw here, and I want to spend a little bit more time in that, is that they were defending what God had allowed them to build. And I feel that we lack that holy anger Holy anger, not worldly anger. That holy anger to defend and protect what God has allowed us to build. Our families, our families, our businesses, our churches, our lives. Are you with me, church? And these are the three things that we can see here. There's way more. But I'm just going to quickly go in here interceding. You know what? I... Um, I want to say this, that we cannot build without interceding. We cannot build. We will not build. We'll have a show here. We will have a show of lights, of music. We'll have a show when we do anything. We'll just have an event. May as well just join another club. They do a better job putting an event together. Are you with me, church? The church then does things without the praying, the interceding, the breaking, the winning the war in the prayer room. It's just a show. We're gaining people. We are gaining multitudes. The churches are growing, but there's no life changing. The world continues the same. There are no transformation. Are you with me? Marriage is still the same. Uh, drug addicts is still with the same problems and things like that. And I know that there is a battle sometimes. I know that there is something that they are, they, they, it takes time. But there is no transformation. And yet the churches are growing. Because we are very good at putting a show. An event. 
and making people feel good. But we haven't war. We haven't won the war in the spirit. The word of God bless the families. God bless the people. God bless the marriages. God bless the students. We need to work. I love that for five years now, we have been going to Mount Tommy. I keep on saying that, and I'm proud of that. Not in a humanly pride, but because at six in the morning, it's like I usually just want to, the only thing I want to run at six in the morning is my curtain so I can keep on sleeping. You know, some people go to run that time. But I love that. We are praying. We're praying for you. We're praying for the families. We don't know every family's name, but we're praying for every single family, every single Tuesday. Every single time that we get together weekly, we pray for you. Because we believe that if we don't have this, it doesn't matter. But the prayers, the touch of the Holy Spirit is what is going to change and edify the church. Are you with me? He says, I will edify my church. I will edify my church. How do you allow God to edify his church? By connecting with him in prayer, in intimacy, in relationship with him. Are you praying for your family, father, mother, student, single, single? Some of you are here as the only Christian in your whole family. Your parents don't believe. Your parents criticize you. Your parents, your parents tell you that you're crazy. Praise God, you're crazy for Jesus. But are you praying for them? Are you interceding for them? I love that how they were here interceding. They were praying. They were there with their, one, with their sword. They were behind the people and were doing something. Are you pray? Do you pray for your pastor? Some of you are visiting here from other churches. Do you pray for your pastor? He's in the front line there. He's building something. Are you with me? He's, a, he's an encourager. Are you praying? Are you protecting him? He cannot do it alone. He needs you. He needs your prayers. He needs your support. Are you with me, church? We need that. Paul said constantly, Paul said, I, I want you to pray for me. As I go, here from, we're going to even read that in a minute. Paul said, I want you to pray for me. We need to pray. We need to pray. We need to intercede. Are you with me, church? But I know some people that just intercede without doing anything. So we have the people who are doing things without praying. It's not going to work. It's just not going to work. But we also have people who are, I'm just an intercessor. I don't go to any local church. I don't give any money to any local church. I don't move a finger in any other local church. It's just I'm an intercessor. Well, why are you building? Building the kingdom. Just what about the local church? What if Nehemiah say, God bless Israel. Bless Jerusalem. What if, if just he just bent his knees and pray every single day? What would have happened? You know what? His name would have not been in that line of names that God is writing. Are you with me? Because he wants us to not only pray, he wants us to do something. So we cannot just say, I pray, but I'm not doing anything. I'm not committed to any local church. What are you edifying? Why did Paul write to the different churches and the different people? Why didn't, he, why, why didn't they just wrote a big letter and whoever you are, church there, out there in the world. Just read it. Why well, was letters, specific letters to the local church with a specific instructions to the local church? Because God cares about the local church. And if you are praying but you are not part of a local church and you are not edifying the local church, you're just praying to the air. You are not doing a biblical prayer. Are you with me? And, and, and I love that part because that's the thing that we can see here. They were doing something and they were praying. They were praying and they were doing something. And we, if we want to see a revival taking place over Victoria, if we want to experience that sustainable 
move of God in our families. I'm not talking, I'm not talking about like, and listen, listen, I, I, I love the day that we're not going to fit here and there's going to be a line up there. We're going to have two, three meetings. But that doesn't wake me up. That doesn't get me excited. Well, it gets me excited, but that, that doesn't take my sleep away. But when I hear a testimony of a family who encountered Jesus, that is a revival I'm talking about. And that's why we need to build a local church to create opportunities for a family who has lost their way to come back to the Lord. And we're going to hear to love, to serve, but sometimes we have to go and rescue them. Come on, come on, come on. Your co-workers, your students, your student mates, your student mates. Are you with me, church? We need to edify. We need to pray. And we need to work. Nehemiah saw the importance of marrying the two together. We need to be people who pray. And we need to be people who does something. Look what it says here in Ephesians 6. I love this here. The message. When I was reading the Ephesians 6, it's 18, but the message puts it together, 13 to 18. And I like it too because it explains the whole thing. Be prepared. You are against far more than you can handle. What? On your own. Take all the help you can get. We need each other. This is the church. This is the local church. If you're a nomad of the church, nobody's going to be there for you. Just take all the help you can you can get every weapon God has issued. Oh, God. Jesus, help us, God. So that when it is all over by the shouting, you will still be on your feet. Family, when this is all over, I want to still be faithful. When we have an event and people give their life to Jesus and they come and see kids or people being life transformed. When I, when I, when, when I, when I go home... After an event and, and then we have people being touched by the Holy Spirit. When I hear a testimony, when you experience victory in your life. You want to remain faithful. That's what, it, that's what the word says. I still, I, I still need to uh, be on my feet. It says truth, righteousness, peace, faith and salvation are more than just words. We're so good at just words. We're so good at, we put it into songs and we sing. Come on and bless the Lord with me. And then I go and do whatever I want after the church is over. We are good at words. It says these are more than just words. Learn how to apply them. Don't you love this? You'll need them through your life. Truth, righteousness, peace, faith, salvation are more than words. Learn how to apply them. You will need them through your life. People of God, we need the word of God. God's word is an indispensable weapon. In the same way, prayer is essential in this ongoing warfare. warfare. Pray hard and long. And pray for your brothers and sisters. Keep your eyes open. Keep each other's spirit up so that no one falls behind or drops out. The kingdom that I'm talking about to build, it's not a building that we're building on Quadra, though that's exciting. It's exciting. We're moving soon. We're, we're getting there. We moved our offices yesterday, and it's going to be great. We still don't want to operate there. It's still a mess. It's still in the... You know, uh, demolition and, and construction, and it's a lot of work. But that's not the church. You are the church. And we need to protect each other. We need to pray for each other. Are you with me, church? Another thing is number two. is So number one is that they were interceding. They were doing something. They were praying for each other. They were protecting each other. The other thing is that they were building something. What are you building? What are you building with your life? What are we building in our lives? We've talked a lot about, about this, about praying and planning. Nehemiah did that. But he was also building. 
We need to learn how to build. Are you with me, church? We need to pray, we need to plan, and we need to build. We need to take action. You know what, people, I was talking to a pastor, to a pastor um, a while ago. And, uh, and there was one of, our, one of our members here. I think I shared this a long time ago. One of our, our, our young people who, you know, yeah, I love about the young people right now. It's like they can be here. They are committed to this local church. But in the evening, they are with other churches and, and things. I come from a generation and it's like, you know, I go to this church and I will not visit any other church. That's it, man. This is like, no, this is it. And the pastor used to say, what, are you, what were you doing at other church? And things like that. Sometimes we get like that. But... Uh, I love that, but but this this guy was like was here. He was part of our church, part of our our, our dream team, and he was visiting another church, and he was a part of the other church and came here and joined our church. I mean, that is not our goal. Our goal is to reach the lost. But sometimes we believe that God will bring people from other churches to help us build. I'm doing this. I'm going somewhere with this, and um, and and I love that thing because one of the things that that he told his old pastor is that. You know what? If you come to Connection, they put you to serve right away. And it's like, oh, really? And they says, yeah, I mean, you, you go through growth track and they check your, you know, everything. And then it's like, you know what I'm saying? It's not just like, oh, here you go with the kids. But, um, but they put you, they encourage you to serve and they put you to serve. They, it doesn't matter if you go to Bible school or not. They, they, there is a room for everyone. And that's the truth. And he says something to her and her told me that it says, and I've seen the growth in his life like I've never seen. It's like came for years to our church, and I, I've seen him now growing more than ever. Why? Because there is something inside of us that happens when you know you're serving the body of Christ. I have the Sunday school teachers right now. My little nephews, including Brian, who is 18, who they were part of our little kids. They were part of our kids. We have photos of them. They, were, they came to our Sunday school. They lined up here during COVID. They grew up, and we lost the Sunday school kids, and now they are adolescents. And they were having a time off with their families yesterday, and they say we need to serve. And they drove last night to be here at church this morning. So they can serve because there is an excitement in them. And talking to their parents is like, oh, they are preparing, they are praying, they are excited, they are practicing some of them. That's why we have our, our, our you know, it, it, you know, our, our kids who are, who are playing, who are still learning. They are doing better and better and better, who are still doing things. Little Sophia, don't you love seeing Sophia? It's not a little Sophia anymore. When she started, when she was 12 years old with us, she was singing so cute. And, uh, and, and now she's like, she's full of life. And there is an excitement that happened in the life of those who serve. We were created to build. When God created Adam, he said to him, work, you need to work. You need to be doing something. He says, but it's not good for you to be alone. And brought Eve and said, now multiply and govern and rule the earth. Are you with me, church? They were created to build. They were created to do something. If you are not building, if you are not building, you are not driven by passion. We are so used to punching the car at work. And it's like, how many people are passionate about going to work? And it's like, oh, it's Monday. Oh, it's like, ah, oh, ah, oh, the beginning of another week. Are you with me? Come on. You're not building anything. You're building somebody for somebody else. You'll be, you know, you're working, you're punching the car, and it's like another, another week. And then, on, you know, at the end of the day, you're like, you're a little bit faster than when you came in the morning, and you just go home, and then you go to, you know, do something, and it's like the next day, ah, oh, the next day, and it's Friday. Friday is here, and then Saturday and Sunday, I'm not going to church because I'm too tired, I'm too busy. And then it's Monday, the same thing again. And, and, and you are wasting your life. Can I talk to you like that? I'm glad that I don't know any particular, so I don't know who I'm talking about. But if it is for you, it is for you. You were created for something bigger than just that. And I'm, and I'm not saying it's wrong to work for somebody. 
But if inside of you, you know that you are not building something that is not a passion, then it's waking you up in the morning, then that makes you see the things that God wants you to see. Are you with me, church? I'm with excitement coming on Sunday mornings. I am so tired on Sundays. I'm, uh, after a week of work, I'm, you know, and it's like, and it's like, oh my goodness, I pray that I, I have a good sleep because if I have a good sleep, then I'm good. And, but there is an excitement that wakes me up in the mornings. There's an excitement that wakes me up because I know I'm building something. Are you with me, church? Look what Zechariah 4.10 says here. I love this part here because some of you may say, oh, should I start now? When should I start? Oh, my church is like this. Oh, my life is like... Some of you are business owners. I bet you are more excited now than when you used to work for somebody. And listen, like I'm, like I'm saying, there's nothing wrong with working for somebody if you know you're building. You're building your own life. You're building your bank account. You're building your future. You're building something. You need to have that in mind that you are building something. I love Zechariah 4.10. It says here, do not despise the small what? Beginning. Do not despise the small beginnings. For the Lord rejoices. With what? With the size of the work that you are doing, oh my goodness, Pepe, you are doing something new. It's like if I compare to friends of mine who are pastoring thousands of churches, a friend of mine in Mexico has planted a church like two two years before we did we, we, we did this. Thing. We're communicating. We are friends. We are awesome friends. We every every time we text. We text, you know, every, every week, and then um, his church is going, and then it's growing and growing, and it's like 2,500 people in his church in Mexico right now. And then I go, look at it. I'm going to go, oh, my goodness, what am I going to do? What, what am I doing wrong? Nothing. Because we were all called. That's, do not despise the small beginnings. doesn't matter about that. You may say, you know, you may say I started something and I'm not doing as well as my other friends are doing or other people, and you begin to compare. It doesn't matter. I love this part here. Do not despise the small beginnings for the Lord rejoices. How does he rejoice? He rejoices with this. To see the work. Then the work what? Begin. That's it. We need to learn how to build. We need to build something. And three. And the last one here. Are you guys with me so far? Have I lost you somewhere? <laughs> The third thing that I see here is that they were defending. They were with sword. With the, they were defending the work of God that the, God allowed them to have to build. Some husbands are not defending their marriages right now. I just want to say this. Some families are not defending their families. Some business owners are not defending their businesses. I love this part here because they were. So when Nehemiah saw that the enemy was building, uh, not building, that the enemy was attacking, he began to pray, intercede. He began to put them into families. He began to put them according to the families. They began to build. We read that, we read that in, in, in chapter 3. They were doing something, and they began to pray. They began to intercede. But you know what? This thing here, when I read the, when I read them, he was like, put them with the sword. And back in this day, it wasn't just the spiritual sword. I'm talking about the the actual sword. You have to remember they didn't know the grace. Jesus came later on and says our, our, our work is not against, and we're going to read it in a minute, it's against uh, flesh and blood. It's against principalities. But they were ready to defend the work that they were doing. Because if you don't defend what God has allowed you to build, the enemy is going to come again and again and again and again and destroy the things that you have built already. I was talking to one of my nephews yesterday. And he asked me. says, hey, tío. Uncle. Yeah. 
When you say to love God, what do you mean with that? Because I hear so many things about loving God. And I say, well, according to, to the Bible, Jesus said to his disciple, if you love me, obey my commands. No, that wouldn't work if I came to my friends and say, hey, you love me, obey me. <laughs> they will say, move on, buddy. But he's not our buddy. He's not our cuate. He's not our buddy. He's God. Yet he calls us friends. But Jesus said, if you love me, if you are really saying that you love me, the love that what I understand for love is action. It's not feeling. We live in a feeling culture that we think that loving is a romance feeling that I need to have for the Lord and for the house in order for me to build and do something and I need to feel and if I don't feel it here I'm just going to go somewhere else God is like forget about your feelings they, they come they go they're all over the map come on if you love me obey me because love is action love is demonstrating in action and he says so how do you obey God by this I told him last night he says, forgive your enemies. Forgive those two who insult you. So if I don't forgive, that means that I'm not obeying for him. I don't even love him. Wait. So all these years that I've been coming to church and I think I love God and it's like he loves you. He loves you. He, he, he showers you with his presence, with his grace, with his glory. He showers you and gives you the strength so you can demonstrate that you love him by obeying a single upon command. Some of you have offense, offenses. This is probably your third, your fourth, your fifth, your 17th church you're visiting and you're, you're just going there and you just want to go to another church where maybe you feel God and you are now in His presence but you're still not forgiven. I'll come a 19 church visit. It's not going to be transformation. Why? Because you're not applying a simple teaching than God saying, if you love me, obey me. Are you with me, church? I've just used forgiveness because it's a big one. But how many different things in our lives we have in the secret and we have not released it to God yet. we build we don't defend it and when we don't defend the enemy comes and brings it down again in another 10 years will go by you'll be in another church sitting maybe in the same area hoping that your life will be changed and you will experience what others have and eventually maybe one day you will give up on God this part here because Nehemiah show us one thing I'm going to pray I'm going to edify and I'm going to defend are you with me church I'm going to fight for what God has given me I'm going to fight for my family I'm going to fight for my business I'm going to fight for my, my relationship with my spouse I'm going to fight for my church I'm going to fight for the people that I love, I'm going to fight by obeying, by standing, by praying, by protecting, by guarding my mouth, by forgiving, by investing. Are you with me, church? How do you defend your relationship with your wife? I, I keep on saying this like again and again. I feel like this is the most. I said to I said to I said to Leah, the more I read Nehemiah, the more I realize this is focused on the family. Wait, wait one second that's a that's a ministry 
Let's focus on the family. And God wants us to edify. How do I defend my wife? I've been investing time with her. How do I defend my kids? Investing time with my kids. I love that because there is an age that they don't recognize that you're investing time with them. What time is it? I just hear everybody going. I love a text that Brandon sent me on Father's Day. I love that. Because it meant so much to me. There is something when you get something, say something to you. My oldest sent me a text and says, Hey, Papa, I really appreciate everything that you do for us to live the life that we're living. And sometimes you don't realize the things that you do for your kids. But they are going to one day come back to you. You know that the whole thing that it says instruct the kid in, in their own ways and when they are big, they will not depart from it. When they are what? When they are what? When they are big. When they are older. So from kids to being older, you will don't know. You, you, you think that you're just doing everything and it's like, come on, this is not going anywhere. I'm not seeing anything. You will see the fruit one day. If you keep on investing in that, you need to invest for your family. You need to, you need to defend for that. Look what it says here in Ephesians 6.10. I'm just going to read. I'm going to continue. So keep on, bear with me. It's, it's a day off right now. Tomorrow you can sleep in. Uh, Ephesians 6.10 to 13. It says here, a final word. This is Paul saying, writing this thing here. Be strong in the Lord and in the mighty power. Pull on the God's armor so that you will be able to what? To stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. He has a strategy. He wants to kill you. He wants to destroy you. He wants to discourage you. He wants to attack your faith. He wants to disappoint you. He wants to do everything he can for you to give up. And Paul said, no, defend yourself. Learn how to defend yourself. Learn how to protect yourself. It says here, so you can stand firm against the strategies of the evil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in the dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to, to what? Exactly what Nehemiah did. We're going to build, we're going to edify, we're going to pray, and we're going to protect. We're going to defend ourselves. Are you with me, church? He says, so you'll be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil when the enemy is attacking. You know what's the biggest thing, that, the biggest mistake that we make? That when we think that we are doing well, we stop praying. That we think that we're doing something for God, we stop praying and seeking the Lord. It says, you know, it, there is an evil time that is going to come here. And then it says here, and then after the battle, you will stand, be standing firm at the very end. I love that part here. Family, you, I, I want to say this. And when I say you, it's all of us. We need to stand for what we have built so far. How many of you are under attack? Your marriage is under attack. We are under attack. We are in a constant attack. My wife and I. I'm not going to hide it. We're going to, we are, we are. If there is somebody that is under attack in this place here, in the marriage, it's me and Leah. If the enemy can come and break this relationship, he's creating a big effect. Then it tumbles down. We're two strong characters and we are in constant attack. And sometimes we give in. And God shakes us up and says, wake up. It's no time. It's time to defend your marriage. It's time to invest in your marriage. It's time to, to stand firm. It's time to pray. It's time to fast. Are you with me, church? So when I say who is under attack, it's like, oh, am I an evil one? No. That means you're powerful. This position doesn't give us the power. You know what gives us the power? Our obedience to the Lord. We are powerful in the Lord when we are obedient to the Lord. You are powerful. You know why you're under attack? Marriages? Is any marriage here under attack? Lift up your hands. Lift up your hands. 
You know why? Because you are powerful. Not because you are weak. Not because you are a nobody. Because you are powerful in God. That's why the enemy comes and attacks you. See, if the enemy didn't think that the walls of Jerusalem meant something, he would be like, I don't care, build whatever you want. If the enemy didn't think that the church is doing something against his kingdom, he will not attack. And some of you think that, oh, I'm doing so well, I have not been attacked. That means that you are just maybe dormant, maybe you are doing, not doing, you are, maybe you're not building something significant. But when you are under attack, that means that you are building something that threatens the enemy. And if we are going to edify, if we are going to build the kingdom of God, if we are going to build it, edify the, the kingdom of God, we're doing something against the enemy. He's, this, we are going to be under attack. But fear not. Because God is for us. And God is with us. And we are going to learn how to defend ourselves. Are you with me, church? We're going to learn how to defend ourselves. You know, the enemy wants to steal your kids. I mentioned that again. I've been, I've been every, almost every single Sunday. I've been talking about this. The enemy wants to attack your kids. The enemy wants to steal your kids. And it's time for you to stand and say, you will not touch him one more day. And begin to pray and begin to defend yourself. And begin to proclaim the word of God over your family, over your kids. Are you with me, church? Over your businesses, over your life, over your job, over your relationships. You need to learn how to defend yourself. Are you with me, church? I hope you're not feeling condemned for this. I hope you're feeling encouraged. I, I, I hope there is a holy fear, a holy fear of God, yeah, but a holy roar inside of you that is waking up right now that is making you think, I am going to learn how to fight for, for what I have built so far. For my family. For my girls. For my boys. For my spouse. For my parents. For my relationships. For my friends. And I love this thing here. If we continue, it says, Then I explained in verse 19. Then I explained this to the nobles, to the officials, and all the people. The work is very spread out, it says here. And we are widely separated from each other along the wall. They were all separated along the wall. And then he said this. When you hear the blast of the trumpet, he's telling them this. Because there is a way to build. Now I finish with this. It's a way to build. This is when you hear the blast of the trumpet, rush to wherever it is sounding. If you're around the corner and you are building your life, you're with your wife, with your spouse, with your friends, with you, with by yourself, with the, but, but all of a sudden you hear the sound of the trumpet. He says, what is it? What is it sounding? Oh, Sunday morning. You know that? You know that when we give an announcement, say, say, hey, come to Tuesday mornings. You know what we're doing when we say, Tuesday morning, we have prayer meeting at 6.30 in Mount Tommy. Come! You over here. Hey, once a month we have prayer. We have worship for one and a half hours, maybe two hours. Sometimes it's so good. We just keep on going. A quadra street in our new place. Come. And you're over here. Come early in the morning and pray for us before the service. Let's pray for every single chair here before the service. Come. We are having the small groups. You can meet people. You can pray together. You can edify your life with others. You can do life with others. You can feel now that you belong to a place. Come! 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 You know what we're doing? When we have an event and we bring guest speakers, spend a lot of money to bring speakers hotels traveling we have to we have to take care of them because they carry an anointing God is using them around the world and we want to bring them here to our church to you we sounded a trumpet because we want you to be encouraged to be edified you know what happens sometimes we have events and our half of our church doesn't show up 
It's not like a day off, weekend off for us. Other churches fill this place and half of our church don't show up. And then you go and send us a text and says, hey my goodness, pray for me, I'm going to talk. We do it. But when you hear the trumpet sound, announcements, our trumpet sound, it's come, let's pray together, let's build together. Are you with me, church? Be a part of a small group. Be a part of our prayer team. Be a part of the life that God is doing. So it says here, so when you hear the trumpet, rise to whatever is sounding, and then our God will fight for us when we get together on Quadra Street. We will get together on Tuesdays. It's like, Jesus, just, just we just bless you. We just exalt you. Just We just enthrone you, God. We thank you so much. Father, I pray somebody says, oh, I need my family. It's under the struggle. We pray for that person. Oh, my business. Oh, my goodness, I have a problem. We pray for that business. We begin to pray for each other. I love that Nehemiah wrote this in his diary. I get excited about this because I want to I wanna tell you there is a trumpet that is sounding don't ignore it run to what is sounding because the Lord is going to fight for us you will not if you fight alone you won't go far doing life alone it will not take you far the commitment determines your results. Your marriages, your finances, your families, your relationships. It's so precious and so valuable for you to just let the enemy come and take it away from you. Well, that's all we have for you today. If you liked the message that you just heard, don't forget to like it, let us know your comments below, and share it with as many people as possible. Please follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and our website. If you're in Victoria, Canada, we would love to see you this upcoming Sunday. God bless you and see you soon.